Thank you for joining our February webinar series here at OJM Group. Uh, we're pleased to have you listening and uh, following along. Today, the topic for discussion is more investment related, specifically uh, relating to diversification and why why United States investors need to look globally when creating their, their asset allocation portfolios. Just a couple pages of disclaimers here. Uh, high level OJM Group, we're an SEC registered investment advisor. Before we jump into the presentation, I also wanted to let everyone know that our OJM materials are free to attendees that follow along with the webinar today. You can see the books there, physician related with different state and specialty topics. And then for business owners, the fortune building book, as well as the designing for wealth book. So let's jump right in today. Uh, I'd like to start by just kind of taking a step back and looking at what the global stock markets have done both you know since since the financial crisis in in late 2008 early 2009 and and then really you know re, more recently in the last 3 to 5 years as well so a, a couple of things have have converged lately one of them being the large run up in the US dollar the the currency compared to global currencies so as a United States investor who pays his bills in dollars that can certainly impact your returns abroad, both in the European international space as well as the emerging market space. So you can see here uh, on this chart for the third straight year, dollar appreciation was a drag on foreign stock returns. Uh, the major decliner was the British pound, really most of that relating to the summer months when Brexit, the vote passed and the, the Brexit uh, announcement was made we really saw a huge sell-off in the British pound compared to the US dollar and then also again this is the fourth straight calendar year and six of the last seven going back to the, the financial crisis times that US stocks have outperformed foreign stocks uh, and again this is one of the longest stretches of, of US outperformance on record and you can see a lot of this was even intensified by the increase in the US dollar. So you can see here on this chart again is US stock returns since 2012. This is cumulative coming up on 100% for US stocks. However, in developed international, same, same index in terms of tracking purposes, but one is in local currencies. So pound or you know Japanese currency or or potentially some other peripheral European currencies compared to what those same returns did in US dollar terms. You can see they were much less, almost really half in US dollar terms, and that was all the appreciation of the US dollar. So moving along, we can see here, we've had quite a rally in the dollar, and it looks and has remained, we think, overvalued compared to a basket of other currencies. You can see what, what comprises that basket over there on the right side. But really, we have been in overvalued uh, territory on the US dollar for really three years now, in our opinion, um, which again, impacts your global returns. Here's just another view, adding in emerging market stocks. So performance has been even has, has, has been worse in the emerging market space, not necessarily all attributable to currencies, but, but certainly has been almost flat since 2012, nowhere near the returns of, of the US stock market. And, and really what we're gonna, we're gonna hone in here on as we, as we move along, I think our analysis really implies that from current price levels, both European and emerging markets are likely to generate much higher returns in the US. Now, there's no certainly no guarantee in that. There's no guarantees in the stock market, and we don't know how long 
you know, a potential dislocation could carry on for, but but we do think European and emerging market stocks are poised to outperform U.S. stocks moving forward. Here is just another view going back to 2007, how both developed international stocks, really you think European, Japanese stocks, as well as emerging market stocks have fared since really the height, the peak of the market in 2007. So you can see pretty abysmal returns in both emerging and developed stock markets, whereas U.S. stock markets have, have had a nice run since, since the peaks in 2007. Now, why, do we, why are we talking about this? I think for us, we're always trying to educate our clients on, you know, trying to go where the puck is heading, not where it's necessarily been. I think for us, a lot of clients see the returns in the U.S. stock market the last five to seven years and automatically say, well, Ed, you know, why do I not have more of my portfolio exposed to U.S. stocks? And for us, I always like to come back to this chart that shows how stock markets move in cycles. Yesterday's losers or loser is often tomorrow's winner, and you can see this theme playing out over a longer time period than the last really five to seven years. So I'll, as we've alluded to, we are in a pretty substantial market in terms of outperformance in the U.S. stock market versus international stocks here on the right. Um, but that isn't always the case, and we just wanted to show some examples where you've had extreme outperformance in international stocks uh, in previous periods of time. So why are we really talking about this? Again, we want to make the long-term case for global equity exposure. We think it remains a compelling story. Again, like I said, asset class equity markets go in cycles. It's, it's unwise to extrapolate recent or past performance trends too far into the future. Um, I think a lot of times we see clients overconfident in their ability to predict changes in trends and cycles and are, are not the best at timing their buying and selling. Um, you know, when you're when you have a globally diversified asset allocation porf driven portfolio, I think you're always going to have some piece of that portfolio lagging while others are performing uh, better. I think it's important to know that you cannot consistently predict which asset classes will outperform and when. You know, you could certainly come in with theses as to why you think one market's going to outperform the others, but that doesn't always necessarily play out. So let's just go back to a real world example of how adding global stock port stocks to your portfolio can help not only potentially increase your, your rate of return, but also lower the standard deviation of the portfolio or the, 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 the variability of the risk. So in this example, we start both portfolios with a starting value of a million dollars. The global stock portfolio is comprised of 60% U.S. stocks, so still very heavily weighted to U.S. stocks. By no means are we abandoning that uh, sector or asset class. But it also has 20% in MSCI EFA, which is developed international European Japanese type equity names, as well as 20% in the MSCI Emerging Market Index. And as you can tell, the return is uh, higher by 0.6%, which on the surface doesn't seem like a lot, but when you extrapolate that out over 35, 40 years uh, and, and adjust for the impact of uh, compounding interest, you can see you're left with a substantially higher ending value than an all U.S. S&P 500 type portfolio. It's, it's over actually $28 million difference. So Although the percent numbers don't look like it's much on the surface, when you extrapolate that out into dollar terms, it, it can be very substantial. So back to our just theme and outlook for U.S. stocks. We, we think longer term, our outlook for U.S. stocks is pretty muddled. We remain somewhat bearish. We expect low to single, low single digit annualized returns over the next five years in kind of our base case uh, scenario. And a lot of it's driven by the valuations. I think U.S. stocks are somewhat expensive, and, and they're near the upper end of their historical valuation range here, as you can see by this chart, both from a price-to-equity perspective and a price-to-sales perspective going back uh, to the mid-60s. We're, we're well above that median trend line and really 
almost above where we have been all, in terms of all-time highs. Um, not quite the same on, on price to equity. You know, I think back in the early, late 90s, early 2000s dot-com, valuations got even further stretched or stretched further, but, but we are above uh, average in terms of pr both price to equity and price to sales ratios. Um, you know, continuing on our theme for low expected returns for U.S. stock portfolios and, and, and taking that a step further, the traditional 60% stock, 40% bond for portfolio, we really do think the, the returns you've been able to accomplish long term, you know, if you go back to the 1950s, rolling five-year periods, you've, got, you've been able to achieve about a 9, 9.5% rate of return with that portfolio. However, we really dampen those returns moving forward because of our low expectations for U.S. stocks. And, and we do think that it's important to look at those non-traditional asset classes, such as the international and emerging market uh, equities on, on the stock side. And then certainly, we don't touch a lot on this today, but you can certainly look at some of our other webinars or podcasts on our website. But really diversifying out of traditional fixed income as well into some more floating rate or or higher yielding type uh, type names here is just another few uh, illustrations of to point to that there is a mild economic recovery taking hold in Europe I think valuations are attractive especially relative to US stocks um, Earnings growth is, is fair and forecasted to improve, and we've seen it improve here uh, in the fourth quarter as earnings have been reported here uh, in early 2017. I think all these factors that you see here, employment continues to, to, to fall, and it's approaching getting below 8%. Um, now, certainly, there's, there's other factors outside of uh, some of these fundamental statistics that we've, we've looked at, but you know, whether it's political or macroeconomic landscape continues to dominate the near-term outlook. And I think that's why we haven't seen these markets take off as much as they would in an isolated market. Um, kind of some of that nationalistic theme that we've seen play out over Europe and some of the peripheral countries as well. On the earnings front, I think we continue to see corporate earnings growth in Europe improving. Um, you've already seen a crushing earnings recession, which we this area hasn't seen in 50 plus years. Um, but and you really can see the large divergence between earnings between European equities and U.S. equities, which going back to 2000 has never been this wide as it is now. Um, you know, also I think, you know, on top of, of, of some of these these points we've made from an earnings perspective, I, I also think European companies have done a lot of restructuring really since the summer, since some of this Brexit noise has, has hit the markets. They've drastically cut costs, improved operating margins, profit margins. So I do think that if we do see a global growth pickup story or economic revival, I think there should be substantial impact on the underlying earnings in, in European stocks. This, this is just taking that a step further and adding in emerging market stocks. You can just see from a relative uh, price to earnings standpoint where they are to their historical median. U.S. stocks are about 20%, 25, 26% overvalued, whereas European and emerging market stocks are 30, 30% plus undervalued when you look at a historical uh, median data point on a price to earnings ratio. So I think again this is just another case for why we think there's attractive valuations relative to US stocks. And then my last slide uh, for the day is just a graphical depiction of why diversification works over time. You know typically last year's winner is the next year's loser or vice versa. Um, although we've seen the last three, really the last four, five, six years, U.S. large cap stocks have really outperformed international stocks. But over longer time periods, that's not necessarily always the case. And, you know, for us and our client base, we're always trying to streamline the returns. We're trying to certainly uh, participate in as much upside of the markets as we can, but really limit the downside 
uh, that the portfolio could uh, exhibit. You know, prime example, 2008, if you had a balanced portfolio, yeah, you were down 20, 23%, but nowhere near the downturn that U.S. large cap stocks were down 37% that year. So again, just furthering that story of, you know, we want to kind of live in that balanced portfolio zone where, you know, we're not typically going to be the highest performer in a given year, but we're also not going to be the lowest performer in a given year, just kind of staying steady in that middle range. So that concludes the uh, analysis today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation, uh, found it worthwhile. Uh, you know, in terms of how OJM works with clients, we do do, we have expertises outside just investments in, in, in our wealth management division. You can see them listed here. You know, we do place a, a, a large emphasis on some of the ancillary planning topics, whether it's asset protection, helping with uh, reducing your tax liability in a given year uh, for some of those business owners whether it's physician or outside of the medical world, helping with corporate structure, benefit or retirement planning, setting some of that up, taking a look at, at some of those items in terms of your, your corporate structure benefit plan package. And, and then also we have uh, an insurance team here that helps with, with a whole host of items on the insurance end. A little more about our firm. Uh, we are a wealth management firm. We work with a thousand plus clients all across the country. We're Primarily headquarters here in Cincinnati, Ohio, but we have offices in Arizona, Florida, and New York. Like I just mentioned on the previous slide, take that multidisciplinary approach where we really are looking to be that financial quarterback in our, our client's entire financial well-being. And this can cover both the, the practice, the corporate level, or the personal level as well. If you enjoyed the discussion today and would like to learn a little bit more about our firm, feel free to go to our website directly and request a free copy of one of our, our books and use the promotional code OJMWeb, no spaces, at your checkout to receive that free copy. Again, my name is Adam Braunschweidel. I am a wealth advisor here at OJM Group, certified financial planner as well. My contact information is there. Feel free to email me if you have any questions relating to your specific portfolio or investments. We'd be glad to uh, schedule a free consultation and, and provide some potential ways that we could help. Thanks again for your time and uh, look forward to potentially speaking with you all.